I'm going to call the meeting to order. I believe we have a quorum. It's now uh, 5.05. .05, and we're going to call the meeting to order for the uh, Advanced Transportation District regular board meeting to kick off with that, uh, that one of our sessions. Uh, and with that, I think if we could just take a moment here to pause uh, and reflect on the work we're about to accomplish. Thank you. If you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. That, and that's very special today, the day after Memorial Day, and I'm sure we have a lot of uh, uh, colleagues, whether they're employees or whether they're writers who are veterans and have served this country in the past and, and have done so honorably, we want to express our appreciation to them and all their work. Uh, Mr. Arndt, do we have any announcements? Uh, not for this meeting, no, sir. Okay. From what I understand, um, we are under a tornado watch, um, and, and so we're going to be keeping track of that if that it escalates to a tornado warning, uh, we will be notified and we'll take uh, appropriate action. Sorry, Gerald, you gotta stay, you can't leave. <laughs> uh, he was trying to sneak out already. Okay, um, we have, uh, we're gonna do the ATD agenda first uh, and our citizens to be heard is under the regular VIA board agenda. So we'll, go, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, with that, the first item on the agenda is item number three, which is the uh, consent agenda. Uh, do we have a motion on that? Second. Mr. Lee moved approval, and I believe Mr. Allison seconded? Yes. And we have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions? Changes, additions, deletions? Hearing none, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? Motion carries. Okay, that brings us then to item number four, which is uh, MPO presentation. Uh, and I believe uh, we've got Clay Smith here to make that presentation. Oh, plus our guest, Sid Martinez. Thank you for being here, Sid. Yes. My name's uh, Clay Smith, the director of the ATD. And, uh, and uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and board members. And this evening, uh, we have a guest, uh, as you know, as you already recognized Sid Martinez, the executive director from the uh, Alamo area MPO, uh, the new name, and, and we've asked him to come and kind of give an update on the MPO and um, kind of from our workshop uh, we had a few a few weeks ago, uh, there was some questions on the MPO and boundaries, and so Sid's going to go through a presentation and then uh, and answer any questions that you uh, might have. So Sid, I'll let you have Thank you, Clay. Thank you, Chairman and members of the board. Uh, my name is Sid Martinez, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to tell you a little bit about the MPO, who we are, what we do, and talk a little bit about MPO boundary that we just recently expanded and why we expanded it and the way we expanded it. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our current long-range plan and, and the update that we're doing with that. So let me get this started. And I know some of you have seen either parts of this presentation or um, have uh, probably could give this presentation, but uh, again, I know that some of you are, re are really new, so I'd like to kind of introduce the MPO, who we are, what we do, and then we'll go from there. Uh, basically, the first, very first slide is what is an MPO? And MPOs are created by federal law in urbanized areas with a population of 50,000 or greater. Uh, actually, Congress created MPOs in the 1970s in order to ensure that um, local elected officials and appointed officials had a say in the regional multimodal transportation planning for the region. So as an agency, we are responsible for setting policy, guiding the transportation planning process, and most importantly, allocating federal transportation funding to projects and programs. There are currently over 300 MPOs in the country and 25 in Texas, and each of them is pretty different in nature and how it's uh, constituted, how it's set up, and those kind of things. Our transportation policy board uh, is made up of 21 members. Uh, they oversee the entire MPO planning process 
We do have an executive committee that's made up of nine members. They meet as needed to kind of help set the policies uh, and guide the transportation planning process with the Transportation Policy Board. It's made up of Transportation Policy Board members. And we have a technical advisory committee that provides technical and planning and programming uh, advice to the Transportation Policy Board. And then under the technical advisory committee, we have a bicycle mobility advisory committee and a pedestrian mobility advisory committee. This is a list of our 21 uh, member board. Uh, it's represented through the city of San Antonio, Bear County, um, the city of New Braunfels, city of Seguin, city of Bernie. Uh, we have the Greater Bear County Council of Cities, the Northeast Partnership, TxDOT, and then of course we have a VIA Metropolitan Transit representative and the um, Advanced Transportation District representative as well as an Alamo Regional Mobility Authority representative. The chairman of the MPO board today is Councilman Ray Lopez and the vice chair is Commissioner Kevin Wolf. And the ATD representative is Gerald Lee and our uh, your VIA board representative is Dr. Richard Gambetta. This is a map of our MPO, uh, current MPO boundary. That boundary was recently expanded from primarily Bear County to include all of Bear, Coma, Guadalupe, and a portion of Kendall County, mainly the city of Bernie. This represents an area close to 2 million people uh, who travel over 50 million miles per day over 10,000 miles of roadway. Going back to this, I know some of you had some questions on on the recent MPO expansion and why we didn't go expand to the south. So I'm going to kind of explain what drove this MPO boundary expansion and then kind of talk to that, uh, that question within the next few slides. In terms of boundaries, the federal government does, um, again, oversee MPOs and they define two very specific boundaries. The first is the urbanized area boundary, which is determined through census information, and the other is the metropolitan area boundary, or what we call the MPO study area boundary. It, this is a planning area that is uh, set by the MPO board and approved by the governor or his designee. The urbanized area, again, is defined through the Census Bureau, um, which is based on population densities. The urban area populations are normally released two years after each decennial census, and in this case, the last urbanized areas were released in March of 2012. And um, the way this works is that you start with a population of 2,500 people, and you continue to grow that urbanized area as long as it meets a certain standard. In 2010, that standard was uh, 500 people per square mile. So as long as there's 500 people per square mile, that urbanized area will grow. It doesn't follow any city or county lines. It can across multiple cities, multiple counties, but that's kind of the way that's set. Any, any area with a population of 50,000 or more is an urbanized area. Any, any area with a population of 2,500 2, to 50,000 is considered an urban cluster. And then any area outside of either an urban cluster or an urbanized area is considered rural in nature. And federal regulations state that the MPO boundary <laughs> at a minimum shall cover the urbanized area and the geographic areas likely to become urbanized within the 20 year, for, 20 year forecast period covered by the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. In other words, the MPO boundary should be larger than the urbanized area. Federal rules state that the MPO boundary may also encompass the entire MSA, or it could also include the non-attainment area uh, as defined through the Environmental Protection Agency. As of today, we are in attainment. If at some point we are declared non-attainment, which we expect should probably may happen within the next year, uh, at that point we'll reevaluate the MPO boundary to ensure that we cover at least the, the entire non-attainment area. Regardless of what you use, the boundary should foster an effective planning process that ensures connectivity between modes and promotes overall efficiency. This is a map of the current Metropolitan Statistical Area, their MSA. As all of you probably already know, there's eight counties within the MSA, including Kendo, Coma, Guadalupe, Wilson, Atascosa, Medina, Bandera, and of course, Bear County. The blue line, or the blue blob that you see here is the urbanized area. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't follow, follow any county or city lines. It's purely, purely based on population density. And so in 2012, this was designated as the census uh, urbanized area for San Antonio and New Braunfels. It was the first time that New Braunfels was actually added to the San Antonio urbanized area. Uh, and it was actually the first time that the urbanized area, as you can see, went into Kendall County, uh, mainly through the city of Fair Oaks Ranch. And then again, this is the MPO boundary that was set last year uh, to ensure that we were meeting federal standards. It was all of Bear, Coman, Guadalupe, and a portion of Kendall. Now, I know that some folks have asked um, why we didn't go further south, both through this board and through other entities. Um, and, and the reason is that, again, the MPO boundary is driven through the, the urbanized area boundary. And as you can see, again, with the blue, the urbanized area boundary has traditionally grown to the north, to the northeast. Um, and it has not really 
grown very much to the south over the last two decades. In fact, it's just now barely passing 410. Um, the populations in the counties to the south are very small compared to the populations to the north. Uh, in fact, as all of you know, the, the, the population within the MSA is over 2 million and 1.7 million of those folks live in Bear County. So aside from Bear County, the populations in the other seven counties are pretty scarce. Um, but the, popula the populations to the counties to the south are even much less than those to the north. Um, and again, that urbanized area is really what, dr what drove the MPO boundary to expand to the north. I, I want to stop there and see if there's any questions on the MPO boundary, what, what we did and, and why we went in that direction. And Dr. Sid, would you explain to the board, uh, as you have well to me before, uh, about the option to enter the MPO? Sure. Um, just to the south. You know, the, the MPO boundary expansion doesn't have to happen just every 10 years. It can happen at any time. And in fact, if the MPO board wanted to expand the boundary tomorrow, they could again, as long as those areas were interested in joining the MPO. Um, the issue that we're having is that we just now went through this boundary expansion, of course. At the time that we went through it, it was not a harmonious process. We had a, a lot of difficulty in expanding the boundary because Coma and Guadalupe were interested in, in forming their own MPO at one point. Um, so it, it was not an easy process for us to go through, and we're still going through some learning curves in terms of the expanded boundary. Could we expand to the, to the south today, tomorrow? Yes, we could. Um, but again, those, those areas would have to, one, be interested uh, in being a part of the MPO, and then two, the board would have to have that interest as well. And the difficulty is that in expanding the MPO boundary, then you're required to obviously invest in transportation infrastructure within those counties. And so most of the money that we get in this region uh, from, a, from a funding perspective is based on the urbanized area population. Our MPO planning funds, our MPO discretionary construction funds, your via uh, FTA 5307 funds are based on the urbanized area population. So expanding to the south wouldn't get us necessarily additional money and we'd be taking on the infrastructure needs of those communities. There is one um, funding source that is, de that is determined through MPO boundary um, population and that's, um, it's one of the categories of funding that TechStop provides to the MPO. Traditionally, in, in the past decades, it has been one of the largest uh, funding sources, but recently it has not. And so, again, we'd be taking on the infrastructure needs of those counties without necessarily getting funding for them. Also, because the populations are so low uh, in those counties, we wouldn't really be getting much in terms of those, those funding pots. Yeah, so, Sid, uh, yeah, Sid, if I could jump sure. in. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us see with the Eagle Ford shell, the explosive growth out there, but what we have to realize is those aren't permanent residents. And so we don't get, we don't get the funding, but we get, we get to fix all that infrastructure. And while it'd be wonderful, you know, to see, we, I think we all want to see the infrastructure in that area improve, but as the MPO, um, we would just be inheriting, um, their infrastructure difficulties. That's absolutely right. Uh, in fact, you know, most of the counties where the Eagle Ford show activity is happening, as you can see, is outside of the MSA. So it would be very difficult for us to expand the boundary outside of the, the MSA, first of all. But second of all, yes, we'd be taking on all of the problems that are associated with the infrastructure in those areas without really any return because, again, the populations weren't there in 2010. Uh, they won't be accounted for until 2020, if then, if, if the populations are still there and they're permanent residents. So there's a lot of issues associated with that. Um, but so it, it would be very difficult to expand that far south. Mr. Chair, I have a question. <clears throat> uh, Sid, the, the map shows um, why it maybe makes sense to go into, obviously, the, the areas of Comal and Guadalupe that you described. You see the, those blue blobs that you described. And so you, I guess you're anticipating that there will be continued growth in that area. But I noticed that towards Medina, uh, there's a little blue blob or whatever spec that's right on the border of Medina, yet we're not going beyond sort of, it seems to me, the very strict county line there, which is not how we're supposed to be looking at this, it sounds like. We're supposed to be able to kind of look at both county lines, city lines, maybe as some kind of indication. But as we did in Kendall County, we kind of went into part of it, not all of it. I, uh, the reason I raise this question is because I think that, you know, we have this unique transportation outline of, of our roads, the, the I-10, 35, and all of that. It's this, you know, these orbits that um, we have all of this infrastructure already on the south, for example, that, you know, could replicate theoretically if there was development in that area. 
you know, the transportation ease that we see in the northern parts of those loops, like Loop 1604 and so forth. Anyway, so it just went, I wonder whether any thought was given into going into parts of Medina and maybe, I don't know, maybe parts of Wilson County or something to not lose sight of those opportunities to obviously anticipate that, you know, perhaps there will be growth in those areas. I, as I said, the Medina one seems to pop up right away. I, I cannot imagine that the population potential stops at the Bear County line. No, you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, the city's ETJ actually stretches into Medina County, as you know. So, um, yeah, if, if we expand it um, any further, our recommendations would be that it be Medina and Wilson County for sure. We do, um, we have a travel demand model that looks at how people move within the MPO boundary. And actually, we model past the MPO boundary. And our travel demand model currently covers Wilson County. In the next update of the Long Range Plan, um, we will look at adding Medina County as well. Uh, and then probably add Escosa um, too. And we might as well at that point add the entire model at least for the entire MSA, even though our boundary doesn't cover that area, just so that we can see how people are moving within the MSA. Um, but yes, if we did expand the boundary again, it would definitely, we would definitely add Medina and Wilson County, in my opinion. And, and w the reason why we didn't go into Medina County this time was we, we, that urbanized area did cut off right at the county line um, for some reason. And, and technically, as I mentioned earlier, federal rules state that your MPO boundary should be where you think your urbanized area will be in the next 20 years. Uh, we were able to show that most of that growth is happening to the north, and so that's why they allowed us just to go to the north. We didn't go west at this point just because, again, we were having such a hard time trying to capture the other counties uh, that we, were, we weren't trying to bite off more than we could take uh, handle at that point, and so that's why we just went that way. Uh, but you're right, Medina County is probably next, and we should have gone there probably, but at this point, we just did what we thought we could handle. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, please go on. The other thing I want to talk to really quickly talk about is our um, long range transportation plan update. The MPO is federally required to, to produce three documents. Uh, on this slide, the first one is a unified planning work program, which outlines our budget, our MPO staff budget, and then planning studies that we plan on undertaking over a two year time frame. Uh, the next here, one here is our Metropolitan Transportation Plan, which outlines futures, goals, strategies, and transportation projects, which will take place over the next 25 years. And then the last one is our Transportation Improvement Program, which is a document that outlines projects that are funded and will go to construction within the next four years. And technically, projects in a perfect world would flow from one to the other. And a good example of that is actually VS BRT project. The MPO did the, uh, did the initial study on the BRT alignment back in 2002. Uh, it was a Northwest Alternatives Corridor Analysis looking at what would be the best um, corridor to, to, to move forward with with BRT. Once the Fredericksburg Road Corridor was identified, that project moved into the Long Range Plan in 2004. And then once funding was identified for that project and we knew that it was going to go to construction, it moved into the Short Range Plan into the Transportation Improvement Program. So that's how projects should technically kind of flow through those documents. But again, I want to focus on the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. It outlines a statement of, of the region's transportation system investment priorities and plans over a 25-year planning horizon. It is updated every five years, so the last plan update was actually done in December of 2009, which means that this plan will be uh, required to be adopted in December of 2014. We've been working uh, pretty significantly on this long-range plan update, and in the next couple of slides I'll show you what we've been doing to date. Uh, it is focused on systems level and it is multimodal in nature. And another important thing that's not listed here is that it is what we call financially constrained, meaning that we, we can only include projects in this plan and in the short range plan as well uh, for which we can identify funding for. We, in other words, it's not a wish list of projects, it's actual projects that we expect to move forward within the next 25 years. Uh, and, and another goal of the plan is to clearly link with regional land use, development, housing, uh, and employment goals and plans. The, the first thing that we do when we um, actually start the Long Range Plan update is do, uh, of course, a population forecast. And in 2010, um, the population within Bear County was pretty significant at 1.7 million people. Uh, and in the other counties uh, that are now included in MPO boundaries, you can see there were significantly less. However, by 2040, we expect to see some tremendous growth within the region. Uh, population in Bear County will grow by over a million people. Uh, to 2.7 million for a percentage increase of 60 percent. And although the, the population numbers are not as high in the other counties, the population percentage increases are significantly higher than in Bear County. 140 percent in Comal County, 
154% in Guadalupe County and 88% in Kendall County. Uh, and then in terms of employment, you can see that Bear County will be, uh, will continue to be the employment hub for this region uh, through the year 2040. Uh, we, we, but we do expect employment to double to 1.4 million jobs by 2040. Uh, and then again, you'll see some significant percentage increases in Comal, Kendall, and Guadalupe counties as well. Sid, if I may, just ask you a loaded question. So if I look at those numbers, we see that most of the growth in total numbers will come in Bear County. Does that mean then that the MPO <coughs> does its planning to reflect those realities, or how does that work? We Most of the planning is done through um, our, tr our travel demand model, and I, I don't want to get too technical, but we have a, a travel demand model that shows where people will be living and where people will be working over the next 25 years. And uh, we have a base year for that, which is 2010, and then we have our out year, which is 2040. And so by the model will show you, again, where people will be living based on assumptions that we make as an MPO staff and MPO board. Um, and so then we look at the system deficiencies over that 25 year period and that's how the, the system investments are made. And so yes, since most of the jobs and most of the people will be living in Bear County, that's where your system deficiencies are gonna be. That doesn't mean of course that there aren't any in those outer counties and we'll definitely uh, look at those as well. But yes, since you know, technically a majority of the jobs and people are living here, this is where this, the investments will be made. Mr. Chairman, uh, it, yes. in looking at the employment forecast for those counties that you have listed, will you also be doing a shadow review of Medina and Wilson County since you are, are thinking of adding them at some point in time? We did not. Do, Wilson is actually a part of this. It's not on this slide because okay. um, they're not part of the MPO boundary, but we, they are part of a travel demand model. So yes, Wilson County is included in all of these forecasts and they are included as part of the travel demand model. We did not include Medina in this long range plan update. We will, or we do plan on including it in the next plan update. And when is the next plan update? We will start again in two years, more than likely. Uh, it will be due in December of 2019, but we start this process so far in advance. Again, we started this work actually right after the, uh, the last plan update, which was December 2009. We started by, two, by 2011, beginning of 2012. And, um, and so a second question, follow on. The, the growth, the employment growth that you have uh, projected for, for 2040 in the other three counties, is that, will that be employment within each of those counties? Yes, it's employment within each of those so counties. There will be jobs and industries and whatever else that would be happening within those counties. Yes. So their, their traveling and transportation issues would be within their W within those counties, but yet are you looking at the transportation needs from a as people commute? As well? Yes, we do. And I, I didn't include a map here, but we actually do look at, um, census does provide what we call journey to work data. In other words, yes. where people live and where they work. And so regardless of whether they live in Comal and traveling into, into Bear, you know, those, those job numbers for Bear County, although there's 1.4 million jobs in 2040, that doesn't mean that everybody's living in Bear. They're, those are just okay. the jobs in Bear. They could be coming in from the other counties. And we do look at that through, through census. You. And I do want to iterate that these, these numbers are, you know, don't come out of anywhere. They're, they're based on state uh, population, uh, the state data center on the population side and on the employment side through the Texas Workforce Commission. Our job at the MPO is once we know what those numbers are by county is is then to work with our partner agencies to look at how we distribute the, those populations throughout the county. So those are the assumptions that we make, not the total growth, but how we, where those people will be living and where those people will be working. Just so, can I go back to the last, sure. if, if you yeah, may? Go ahead, please. The, uh, because when, <clears throat> when I'm reading this, it shows that the employment from 2010 to 2040 is almost doubled, but the population of Bear County is nowhere near doubled. It's only um, a third grader, appro approximately. So does that mean that there'll be higher employment rate in Bear County or that more people will be living further away and traveling to Bear County for employment? You got, it's the second one. Yeah, more than likely it's because the population in, in the other counties is increasing um, much higher than probably that those people are living and finding jobs within those counties and then the other way around, that there's some commuting the other way too. Or, or will it be that the population is growing older? That it's really- It could be that as well. Okay. I mean, those are all things that you can look into when you see these numbers, definitely. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, and Sid, uh, also, I'm sure you're doing this, but also I would recommend shadowing Atascosa also, uh, because a large percentage of their population, I think it approaches 60%, actually do commute to Bear County as part of their employment. 
I may be wrong on that figure, but I think it is over that at this point. Yes, our, our staff recommendation will be that for the next MTP update that we do a travel demand model for the entire MSA, even though our MPO boundary doesn't cover those counties, uh, to, to go ahead and go with all eight counties in that travel demand model. So just quickly, I want to go over kind of what we've done so far and where we are in the long range plan update. Again, we started with the existing conditions and forecast of future conditions, both in population and employment. We then developed uh, our vision and goals for the long range plan. And we did this through an oversight committee, which is made up of multiple agency partners, including via ATD, um, the city, the county, TechStop, uh, ACOG, and then of course, cities in New Braunfels, Seguin, Bernie, uh, and Comanwa Olympic counties. Uh, and so we developed those vision goals. We actually went and did public involvement on those vision and goals. Uh, we then developed growth scenarios. And basically what we did was look at different ways that this region could grow over the next 25 years. And um, I don't want to spend too much time on what those scenarios were, but basically the MPO board uh, at its meeting in March actually moved forward with uh, kind of a more infill development scenario, looking at more growth within 1604, yet not, um, not uh, overlooking the fact that we've had so much growth outside of 1604 and that some of that needs to continue as well. So it, it's kind of a, a combination of what we've seen over the last five, he, five years where we see more growth within downtown, more growth within 410, yet we're still seeing some tremendous growth outside 1604. So uh, it's a very balanced scenario, but, and it's one that is, is very likely. And it's also one that's actually good for transit and good for VIA. So we hope that um, it'll end up being a, a good tr uh, modeling scenario in the end of this process. Uh, the next step uh, that we're actually that we just completed was analyzing those scenarios again and, and in choosing one. And then wh where we're at now is looking at strategies that could um, look at operationalizing that scenario and how we move forward with with the growth that we expect to get over the next 25 years and the employment. So we're looking at transportation, land use, access, and investment. We're also looking at doing what we call an unconstrained look at the at, at our regional system. As I mentioned earlier, our long-range plan is financially constrained, meaning that we can only include projects in there that we can afford, but we think that, the, the, that a, a good exercise to go through is actually look at if, if we didn't have to worry about that um, and we were just concerned with moving people and, and reducing congestion, what would it cost and what, what types of projects would it take? And so we're, we're in the process of doing that now. Um, and we're working with very closely with VIA and the ATD to, to accomplish that. We'll, we'll then look at the impacts and the benefits uh, of some of those projects. We'll come out with a recommended plan. And then the last piece will be, of course, implementation strategy, how we move forward with financing, phasing projects, and who would be responsible for those projects. Sid, real quick, just yep. going back to the, you touched on it a couple of times, this idea of, you know, we can only build with what, we can come up with a plan that we can fund and so yes. forth. That's, is that because we have an unusual funding DOT environment now? That's, where a, that's always been a federal requirement, actually, that the long-range plan be financially constrained. But so. it's not because of perhaps the more recent uh, last three to five years of sort of stalemate, perhaps, on, on funding coming I, from DOT? I think yes and no. Um, yes in that I think, you know, the, the staff at the U.S. DOT for the last couple of decades has seen that Oh, you know, in future financing forecasts, they've seen that the gas tax was becoming less and less viable. So they knew that over the decades there'd be less and less money, although not with the congressional stalemate and all these other things. But just, in, just the fact that the gas tax would eventually not be the best source of funding or the only source of funding. And so they wanted to ensure that the MPOs were being realistic with the community and in, in terms of including projects in these long range plans that we weren't just including everything and anything that if we were putting a plan together that it was realistic in nature and that the public could expect that a project that was there would eventually be built. Um, and so that's why they're, they're financially constrained and that's why that's we're mo we moved in that direction. In terms of the unconstrained needs assessment, um, we, we expect to do that over the next couple of months. And so it, during this month of May, we're looking at developing and uh, refining the solutions packages for the travel demand model. And we're initiating the travel demand model based on this unconstrained needs. In June, we're actually going to be holding public meetings in Comawa, Lupe, and Kendall County to gather input on congested corridors and safety issues. We held similar meetings uh, in Bear County already. For, for these issues, so we're just kind of going back and doing those in those outer counties. Uh, and then we'll refine the solution packages with our study oversight committee, and again, VIA and ATD are part of that. And then in July, we'll run transportation alternatives through the model and evaluate um, some performance measures that will be approved by our Transportation Policy Board to see, again, what the true needs of this community are 
and then at the end of this process we'll siphon off what we can afford but we think it's important again to look at what what the true needs are of the region especially when it comes to high capacity transit uh, and to other highway needs so when you say unconstrained needs that's the ones that are unfunded unfunded yes okay. but okay. We, we think it's important to show what those needs are what what we yes. could do if the funding was there or for example the tiger grant to come up it gives you a way to prioritize some of those yes Okay, any, questions? Uh, any questions for Sid, please? As sitting on the MPO, Sid, I'd just like to thank you for coming, not simply today, but for also for your uh, responsiveness to, to board members and to input and for your accountability as well as competence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gambit. I appreciate it. And I, I do appreciate Jeff's leadership and all of the support that we get from his staff. Uh, you know, we're, we work very closely together in everything that we do. So thank you for, for your assistance. Good. Appreciate it. Gerald, did you want to add anything? Just same as Dr. Gambetta said. Thank you so much, Sid. Thank you, Joe. I want to thank uh, Dr. Gambetta and Mr. Lee for serving on that board, and I know it means extra meetings, and I appreciate your all's uh, uh, vigilance in that and attention, attention to those kinds of details and representing us, and especially the good connection we now have with our planning and project development committee. Con continuity there. Okay, no further questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, that brings us then to the next item on our, on our uh, agenda, which is update on the US Trade One North Park and Ride. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and board members, uh, Clay Smith and uh, I believe Renee Green is here. Yes, as well. yes. I want to invite Renee Green, uh, uh, Bear County uh, engineer, uh, director, manager. <laughs> yes, <laughs> oh, I got one of them. Okay. Well, <clears throat> invited uh, Renee to come as a part of this agenda item as we talk about US 281 and the park and ride facility because uh, we've been working uh, very closely via the ATD with uh, the Alamo RMA and Bear County and TxDOT on the development of uh, US 281 and, and uh, what its uh, preferred alternative uh, transportation solutions are and how it relates to the uh, park and ride. And so I asked uh, Renee to come and they, they uh, had a public uh, meeting here two weeks ago, I guess. May 8th. May 8th, and <clears throat> she had a provided a presentation to the MPL Policy Board, which was very good. And so I asked her to come and talk a little bit about that, and, and we actually have it here. So, so Renee. Thank you. What uh, what Clay's going to start in just a second is the um, the visualization of the preferred alternative, which will be included in the environmental impact statement that the Alamo RMA intends to submit to uh, Federal Highway Administration in June, and with basically a little, little under a month. And um, we had the public hearing last July, and since then we've been taking those comments in and we've been developing what we call a preferred alternative, which meets the purpose and need of the environmental impact statement for the expansion of 281. And early on, we realized it was difficult for people to visualize what we were, what we were going to talk about or propose. So I'm going to go ahead and let this video sort of speak for itself. You're going to see this series of uh, Google Earth images, and then you're going to see the renderings of what uh, is being proposed in those locations. This is also available on the RMA website, as well as um, a little bit more interactive. There you're looking at 1604 and 281, right at the interchange. Those are the southern connectors that were just complete. And now you see the northern connectors, which are part of the project. We're going to be starting from the south at 1604 and moving north. This next segment is just what we call the quarry segment north of Redland Road. You can see that is the existing, and that will be the ultimate what we're building. We believe that these images show that, uh, that the drivers will have many more choices. Um, they'll be able to choose between managed lanes, freeway lanes, or free access lanes in that location. Your park and ride, if you, I'm going to pause it for just a second, just so you can see um, that it, you can see the beginning of the park and ride facility over to your left and the transit lanes that will connect into that. There is a better shot of this when we come back south, but I wanted to pause there so you could see exactly how we, we plan to interact. You can see the buses on the transit lanes going in and out of that park and ride. Um, so as I said, we believe that this preferred alternative, I'm going to start the, the video again, provides uh, more choices for drivers 
a choice between freeway, free express, free access lanes, and um, managed lanes. We think that this will be less congested. And as I'm going to pause it again and stop, what you see in the center is vehicles coming off of the transit lanes that were leaving the park and ride heading north, and what you see on the other side, the southbound traffic, are vehicles that are in uh, the managed lanes that are going to the park and ride. Um, so that they don't have to exit the freeway, they don't have to turn on Stone Oak, they don't have to come in that way. They can, they have uh, uh, a non-restricted access into the park and ride. Renee, having seen part of this before, if I just could ask you to, you, it was such a good line that you said, has anyone ever seen 281 this little congested before? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, we, we believe that Google Earth image was shot at, at, at 5 a.m., probably Christmas morning or, or on a Sunday, cause, because that's, and, and, and it was really funny because someone said, could you add more traffic? And I said, no, because we want people to see the actual Google Earth image. Yeah, they're all on the bus, Clay said correctly. Um, one of the important aspects is, is right now the average daily traffic on 281 is approximately 80,000 vehicles a day. And uh, we estimate that by uh, 2035, that will be up over 200,000 vehicles a day. Now the saturation of 281 in its current configuration is about 90,000 vehicles, which means once you have that many vehicles on 281, you don't have any more physical pavement, no matter how many super streets or how many lights you have or how many overpasses. So this solution will meet the traffic needs um, through 2035. Right now, the level of service on 281 is an F, and that's at all locations, and that's a TxDOT grade. Um, once we uh, are able to expand 281, that level of service will be at an A and that will be at an A and remain at an A through 2038. So as you can see, this is the, the, the northbound, the end of the northbound um, solution. What you're seeing here too is, a, is an interim where we have the, uh, we can support building two uh, uh, managed lanes north of Stone Oak. Um, there is the ultimate capacity for a third managed lane, but that will come at a later date. Now we're about to head southbound. You can see Nor Borgfeld uh, up at the top of your screen. Um, and I really just let the video speak for itself. <laughs> These, by the way, are, like I said, available on the website. Uh, we also have a static uh, um, version, which gives you a little bit more information about each of the sections. Um, did you, you included, you, there is some other stuff that's <coughs> provided in your packets, which kind of gives you a little idea. I think this is the, you know, the closer you get to 1604, the more options and the more choices that you have. Um, these lanes will also include on the free access roads, we'll also include uh, pedestrian amenities, bike paths, uh, sidewalks, so that, that everyone has an option. And I'm gonna stop this. Here's where your park and ride comes in as soon as we get the after. Okay, so you can see where the center of the, um, what we call the, uh, the freeway lanes, you would come in or leave and you would have direct access to the park and ride. You would not have to exit. You would not have to turn on Stone Oak. So this is providing you um, hopefully an incentive for individuals to use uh, that park and ride facility um, and without, with minimal um, <coughs> impact and going through a light or going through uh, a, a traffic scenario. And we will build, uh, the RMA and TxDOT will build up to um, the entrance to your park and ride. And then we've spent some time with Clay and with your staff making sure the grades match and making sure we have the right uh, uh, specifications because this is about a 30 percent design schematic that we've completed for the 281 improvement project. So I'm going to finish off this video and
and this is the last slide that shows you kind of the, the, the entire interchange up in the far uh, right-hand corner up of your screen. And that, um, gentlemen, I'm available for any questions, but this is the visualization that we hope to be able to show over the next several months. Um, as I said, the RMA is going to submit the EIS to Federal Highway in June. Um, we expect to have comments from them and those will be addressed and that EIS will be made available to the public in August uh, and we hope to have a record of decision by December. Thank you, Renee, for that presentation. Any questions? Go ahead. Yes, I had one, Renee, if you'd be so kind. Sure. Uh, is, what is the difference in travel times? Have we figured out what's the difference in travel times during very congested periods between the managed lane and the regular? In I've, we've got that. We've, we've taken a look briefly at, at, at the, at the uh, what we estimate is during peak hour, your travel time will be reduced between 49 percent. Well, actually, it'll be reduced 51 to 63 percent. In other words, you'll be able to get there much quicker, um, and that's all the way through 2038. Dave, Richard? I mean, uh, Dave. David. It's through 2038. When does it start? When will, when will I, we be able to start building? When will I be able to drive my car on that road? If the record of, and that's, that's the great news, this is funded. Um, the, the segment between um, 1604 and Stone Oak is funded with a combination of federal dollars, ATD dollars, um, local dollars. The city of San Antonio had uh, 30 million in their bond program. Um, and then there's 6 million in state dollars. North of Stone Oak, the $230 million cost for that is going to be funded uh, by a state infrastructure bank loan that's going to be repaid with the toll revenues. So with the funding in place, the record of decision in December, we would go out immediately for design bill procurement and could actually start turning dirt in late 2015. Um, we hope to be um, completed within a three to four year period, but you'd have segments of that opening hopefully within the first two years. Other questions? Renee, who's going to be collecting the toll revenue? The Alamo RMA. So the RMA will continue to own the, the right of way? The, the, R, the, R, the Textile will own the facility. Well, excuse me, RMA will own the toll operation of 281. Uh, we will have to work in agreement with Textot on the maintenance of that facility. Obviously, it, it's a little difficult when you have two entities that would be maintaining the same, the same roadway. So we've agreed to work with TaxDOT on, on how that maintenance is, is done. The RMA will, in fact, own the toll operations, and that revenue will go to pay off the $230 million we anticipate <coughs> borrowing from the state infrastructure bank to build north of, of, of Stone Oak. And how many toll lanes are you anticipating? In that section, in the segment, I'm going to start, in the segment between 1604 and Stone Oak, you have what exists out there now, three what we call free access lanes, which operate similar to a frontage road. They have driveways and stoplights. Those three free access lanes will remain in addition, we're going to be building two non-tolled freeway lanes and one managed lane. And that's between 1604 and Stone Oak. So you'll have one managed lane inside each, each in each direction, I'm sorry. So basically, you're doubling the capacity that exists out there now um, from between 1604 and Stone Oak, including the direct connectors. North of Stone Oak, you'll ha you have two in each direction, two existing, and this is why this is so complicated because you, you're saying it's hard sometimes to describe verbally what you're going to build. We have out there two um, free access lanes that are again impaired by stoplights and crossovers and driveways. Those will remain and we'll be building two managed lanes in each direction to the county line. And that's the $230 million part that will be financed through the toll revenue. One final question. The free lanes will continue to be controlled by traffic lights? The free access lanes that exist today, yes. But remember, between 1604 and Stone Oak, we're building two free 
expressway lanes in each direction, which will not be impaired by traffic. Between Stone Oak and 16 Between 1604 and Stone Oak. Thank you. Yes, because well, one of the things you'll you'll have is is you're removing the crossovers when you go north of Stone Oak, so it's it becomes a and I hesitate to say something isn't safe, but it becomes a a safer travel uh, because you don't have that crossover traffic that you currently have out there now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. I have one final question. And I, thank you for the clarity of the presentation, and I applaud everything that you, I mean, applaud what what you, you, you presented today. I did have one question and that, that re refers to access to the managed lane for HOVs. Mm -hmm. Would one, as I understood it uh, previously, that you would have to have a registered uh, carpool Correct. in order to get on and not just multiple people in the car at, at the time you get on? That, that's, the, that's the direction we're heading with that technology, yes, sir. That's, that's a correct statement, Dr. Okay. Gambetta. And that would be a decision made by the RMA? By the RMA board, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Dave, do you have another question? Yeah, is, is there any, well, just for clarification, the number of lanes currently from 1604 past Stone Oak on 281, how many lanes exist now? There are three lanes in each direction. Correct. And after the build out, how many free lanes will there be? There will be more than three. There will be five free lanes in each direction. Got it. I just want to... And one managed lane. And one managed lane. Right. And on the managed lane, is there any thought to the allowance of electric vehicles or other, um, other vehicles without paying the fee? And, and you, make a very, you make a very good point. Um, we fully anticipate the board looking at the tolling policy that exists and that tolling policy might allow for allowances for those types of vehicles that has not been decided yet right now um, the only thing that we do know is that transit will be free and registered carpoolers we've, we've made that that statement they will be free as well um, we could look at dynamic pricing where during the day and off-peak hours the toll may be significantly reduced if you're in that managed lane between Stone Oak and 1604, <laughs> and it could be higher in on in on peak hours, and it would be all about how you maintain that level of service or that speed in that managed lane, and those are all options that are available to the RMA board. What is going to be the deciding factor in those options is we have an investment grade traffic and revenue study that uh, we'll have completed by this fall which will help the RMA board make those types of fiscal decisions. I have a question. Uh, the, right now, we've, the ATD, via ATD board, is a committed uh, $48 million yes, this project? Yes, that's correct. And that's to cover the park and ride access connectors, or what does that pay for? It, it, it is on the sec. oh, go ahead. Yeah, the, the board is a, actually allocated <coughs> uh, um, $100 million and a portion of that was on US 281 and a portion on 1604. The portion that uh, the, the portion the Alamo RMA has on 281 is to the non-toll components of that corridor. So it, it could be part of the non-toll, two lanes each direction, anything but the, the managed lanes. But it's, but so it's that 48 million is not to pay for the park and ride that's separate. We've that's separate. there are separate money that will pay for the park and ride. And what's the estimated cost for the park and ride? Uh, Fifteen million. Five zero. No, five. Fif fifteen. Fifteen. Right. Fifteen million, and and that includes the phase two, which is the the three. It includes garage. the it includes the phase two portion of it, and 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 here in just a minute, I'm going to go through that presentation and and show the board. Okay. And so that's separate from the forty eight million. Yes, sir. It is. Okay. And the total project cost of this that you just presented, Renee, is $458 million? Yes, sir. Okay. okay, any other questions? So, so VIA ATD is providing roughly 10% of that total cost? Yes, sir. 11% or so. Okay. okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I was just thinking that, it, and, and I'm looking at the presentation, it might be helpful for us to see sort of the sources of funds and who's allotting what to these projects going forward, I just so it's easier for us to... 
I, I can tell you fairly quickly if, if I'm just saying in writing would be great because okay I will be more than happy to ear, email Clay yeah. and, and tell him where that's at and he can distribute that to That'd you. That'd be great, yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. I hope it's not a tornado warning. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> Continuing on the uh, on the US two eighty one uh, uh, park and ride uh, agenda item and appreciated Renee coming to kind of give an overview of the, the partnership and how the park and ride fits in with the rest of the transportation uh, around it. Yeah. And uh, so let me just run through this. Uh, back in um, a few years ago, the Smart Move project for the park and ride service on US 281, the budget was uh, six and a half million dollars. And and in 2012, we looked at a concept of the uh, access or the T-ramp, and um, we moved forward. Uh, uh, we have Federal Transit Authority environmental clearance in June of 2013. Uh, the uh, board agreed, and we moved forward and actually purchased all the parcels of right-of-way necessary to not only build at the time phase one, but phase two as well, even though at the time phase two was not uh, not funded, uh, but now the MPO has has uh, approved funding to the um, phase phase two, and but uh, I'll be talking about that here in just a second. Phase one uh, has 170 parking places, and uh, this is the portion that we had funded. Uh, the plans are currently being reviewed by the city of San Antonio. It would take approximately 10 months. Um, uh, once we receive notice to proceed until service could begin and this is an aerial view of the uh, the park and ride facility us 281 is going north and south 1604 is at the bottom of the screen and stone oak parkway there in front of you <coughs> and uh, this is the hundred shows the layout of the 170 parking places that was planned with the um, the, the park and ride facility and it basically fronts uh, Stone Oak as we see it here. This is, uh, looks at what the shelter would look like under phase one. However, <coughs> good news is uh, the ATD and the VIA received $15 million uh, total, 12 million is federal and 3 million local through the surface transportation program, Metro Mobility or what people call the MPO funding. Um, for construction of phase two. Uh, the land was already purchased uh, previously under uh, phase one. Uh, as you, if you just saw, we've been coordinating with the Alamo RMA and TxDOT on the development of this project. We're currently moving towards 30% design uh, for phase two. The entire project itself, phase one and phase two, encompassed uh, 400 parking slots 170 was going to be in phase one and the balance in phase two <clears throat> but as we began to look at phase two and look at um, uh, our ability to capture really everything in phase two uh, we began to look at uh, a multi-story building uh, phase two and this is a rendition of it the you can see it fronts uh, 281 much like you you saw um, in the uh, uh, the, the show a second ago and presentation by uh, by Renee <clears throat> all 400 parking spaces that were a part of the need and purpose for the entire site can be uh, placed in phase two alone by itself uh, in the multiples the four stories the um, <clears throat> the parking structure itself the buses and I'll go through these the parking uh, the, the, the buses will actually come in off of either Stone Oak or they can come in directly off of the, uh, uh, the managed lane and they proceed to the bottom level or the lower level of the parking structure. Each of the levels from the fourth to the third to the second are all part of vehicular parking <clears throat> with the bottom level being uh, uh, bus access for the, for the uh, uh, for our customers uh, also the the way it's been designed is not only can do the buses have access back to the managed lanes 
They do have access to Stone Oak, in which they can service um, the the uh, the golf tournament at TPK Parkway, uh, and also they can come out onto the uh, future access roads of 281 to access 1604 as needed in the future. So there's a lot of we've built in a lot of redundant access there. I might also add that uh, in doing the design, we uh, didn't preclude a Greyhound bus coming in as well for the height. So we didn't want to just restrict it so it's too low so that in the future, if that was discussion, uh, that could occur. So it wasn't precluded. And again, this is an elevation view looking at the park and ride facility. What this does is allows for, and I know that's been always a discussion of looking at joint use land development around, uh, not only privately around the park and ride, but if there were available place parcels within what was purchased, that uh, leases and so forth could be looked at. Um, and so with the development of the phase two, with all the four, all 400 parking places being there, uh, really, phase one um, uh, uh, doesn't really need to move forward because we have everything in the purpose and need with phase two. And so this just shows how land use could be developed uh, around this site. Kind of breaking down the costs, uh, when we looked at phase one, it was an eight and a half million dollar project. Committed today it was 5.2 million. Um, which included the purchase of the entire right-of-way uh, for phases one and two. Uh, there's still uh, 1.3 million dollars available for the program, which and which means we we still need two million to complete phase one. If we look at phase two uh, standalone, the total cost of phase two is 19.5 million dollars, of which four and a half million dollars. Uh, is the right-of-way acquisition, which has already occurred. It's a part of that 19.5. The MPO through the um, uh, federal STPM program, we received $12 million uh, of federal funds uh, there. In fact, right now, the MPO has sent a letter through TxDOT and going to Federal Highway to flex those dollars to FTA so, so we can get that money actually through FTA. Uh, the 1.3 and the 1.7, the total there is the is $3 million, which is the 20% match required for the $12 million. We already have 1.3 million available in the current program, uh, which, and if we looked at phase two standalone by itself, we would just need 1.7 million to finish out the phase two program, which includes all 400 parking places. And then uh, if we continued with with both of them, we'd have uh, actually 570 parking places. We, we only looked at needing 400, but I just showed what the combination would look like uh, right there. Just considerations to complete, um, right, that's about, to complete only phase two, we, we need 1.7 million. Again, phase two has the total of 400 parking places we needed as set forth in the purpose and need of the parking um, uh, ride facility in phase one would provide an area for joint use development opportunities and, and uh, this is just a timeline right now phase one if it was stood alone by itself would be completed and open uh, as mentioned earlier uh, 10 months after notice to proceed which would be about mid 2015 if we proceeded as a standalone phase two by itself um, and we're looking uh, as move forward with that and getting the des finishing and design and the construction. Uh, we could have phase two, all 400 parking places, the whole facility ready to go by 2016. Um, the, uh, if phase two was put in with the US 281 expansion, and really the 281 expansion, as Renee just mentioned, um, the total build out <coughs> actually comes out to 2019. Uh, she mentioned they may actually get the first portion from 1604 to Stone Oak open sooner, so it could be 2017, somewhere in there. Uh, if we stood alone with phase two, we could still get it opened uh, sooner. Uh, and so uh, staff recommends that um, 
because we meet the total purpose and need of having all the parking uh, in the phase two facility, all 400 parking places that we move forward only with phase two, that we uh, stop on phase one, uh, the land would then be available for uh, other joint use development. And also we would continue to move forward with um, developing the project so that VIA would um, develop and uh, construct it ourselves. We wouldn't joint uh, bid with, uh, with the Alamo RMA. We would just, we would do that part of it uh, our own. And so in your package, uh, we have a, <coughs> a recommendation uh, that, uh, that speaks to this, that we move forward with only phase two and, um, and not phase one since we meet the full purpose and need with the phase one, phase two. Thank you for that presentation. Are there any questions? Or let me ask if we have to take action on this today, right? Yes. So uh, we'll entertain a motion then uh, to approve the staff recommendation. So Gerald Lee uh, moves approval and Dr. Gambetta the second. Um, so we have a motion, a second now. Are there any questions or comments? For 1.7 million, we would have 400 spots, and the additional, um, I guess, 176 spots would cost you an additional 3.2 million. So it, numerically, it, it seems like this is not uh, not a hard question. More efficient. Yeah. yeah. Clay, I asked that question before, and I still don't understand it either. So maybe you can attempt to. Well, I think, I think originally as we were moving forward, we were moving forward with phase one. Um, if, I under, if I understand why we're, why we're bringing phase two to the board, is that what the question? No, why is the difference, if we need 1.7 million for phase two and, and two million for phase one, How do you, get to five? you would think that phase one and two would be 3.7 million and not five million. A gap. The bottom row of your chart. Bottom line. We need two million for phase one, 1.7 million for phase two, well, but five million for both of them, but they add up to 3.7. Well, I, <coughs> I think you're carrying over the 1.3. 1 1 yeah, yeah, I think you're carrying it over correct. Yeah, that's that's it. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Supplied the 1.3 to both yeah. phase one and phase two. But joining it at one time. Really yeah, it's the same 1.3. They're just right. moving it. Okay, so, that's right. so they're independent. Yeah, yeah, they're. We're and looking so they at were, them they totally. Were, they should not be a 1.3 million under phase one and two. You can put it anywhere you want. Yeah, you could put it. It's either. <coughs> it's it's either one. It's, it's were, one time. Yeah, I should have had phase one on one slide, yeah. phase two on another slide, yeah. and then the whole phase yeah. the combined on a third third one. Yeah. And so the joint cost is uh, shortfall is 3.7 million because the 1.3 million you're going to only you're going to spend one time. Correct. Yeah, I think that's correct. Plus 1.3. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't apply it twice. Right. Right. That's exactly it. Right. Other questions? Are there other 1.3 million dollars that we can find? <laughs> <laughs> well, and and I and I guess. The, the question I would have is, is where do we anticipate getting the 1.7 million? It was a, <clears throat> it was a part of when we submitted the application to the MPO uh, that uh, working with Steve Lange that, uh, that we would uh, uh, secure those funds within our budget. And so that's what we're looking for to put in the budget this coming year, just to get the one, the ex additional 1.7. So it becomes a projected mandate we we're going to have for next year's budget in other words you're committing to now to put into next year's budget 1.7 million to meet that gap we are not ready to spend any of that we're only ready to start moving forward with design and so we would have it not necessarily 1.7 uh, and if we couldn't come up with 1.7 we'd have to downsize right Right. 
But we're confident we can come up with 1.7. That's the bottom line, is we're confident we can come up with 1.7. Correct, correct. And, I think and if, we'd, if we, uh, we'd, have the, we'd have to come up with 2 million if we went with phase one alone. That's correct. So. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Hearing no further questions, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That brings us in to uh, our next item, which is the uh, ATD multimodal high capacity quarter system. And Clay's gonna make that presentation as well. Yes, and I'm gonna move pretty quickly here because a lot of the information in the presentation was also provided by uh, Sid Martinez. Uh, so if, uh, unless you have a questions on some of them, I may just move right through them. In the, we talked earlier about the region and the new region and the MPO carrying a much bigger area than just Bear County. Uh, this is the same uh, numbers, employment, and population growth that Sid showed a little bit different form, but you can see the one million uh, additional growth um, in population in Bear County, 1.4 uh, throughout the region. <clears throat> Sid talked about uh, doing the mode choice model and scenario two and looking at the distribution of those, those numbers. And that's the key, one of the keys is how are the population employment distributed so they're not just put in one spot and how they're distributed throughout uh, the region and that's what uh, working with uh, the city and, and VIA and the MPO and, and looking at scenario two and, and those refinements there. This is the main part I wanted to really get to uh, is to talk about their, uh, their needs assessment that, they're, that they've developed and this uh, reflects an equivalent lane mile need based on the 2040 demographics and those same numbers you saw earlier in the population employment and uh, this particular one shows, uh, in Bear County, I've got some others kind of showing the outlying areas. Equivalent lane, not, lane mile needs doesn't mean that it's, it uh, necessarily is a, an additional lane that's gonna be built. It's just a way to reflect the uh, demand by people moving through particular roadway corridors. Um, so as, if you look at the index uh, there on the left, um, a one indicates that a, an additional lane mile, uh, additional lane would need to be added to that segment over and above what is already planned in their in the long range plan. Uh, so like US 281 that was talked about earlier by uh, Renee Green, that those improvements are already planned in this in this model, and so. Um, uh, they're a part of the base network. Uh, two, three, four would just mean that there's a greater demand to relieve the congestion in those corridors. Each roadway corridor, depending if you're talking about an expressway or a arterial street, has they have different carrying capacities uh, based on the travel speed uh, and the uh, the uh, land use that's around it that may restrict uh, travel speeds. Uh, on an expressway, for instance, to get to a level of service D, um, you're, you're probably looking somewhere around anywhere from 12 to 1600 vehicles per hour in those corridors in the peak uh, time. And so if you, if you looked at one saying yellow and if it was an expressway that may mean that you need somewhere in the peak around uh, 12 to 1600 cars or uh, would need to be go through that corridor uh, and that's what that need would represent the um, occupancy for vehicles is somewhere between 1.08 and 1.12 and um, so that would equate to in, in terms of people and so this just shows the needs. Of course, the, gray, the, the darker the uh, color, the greater the travel demand need uh, for that particular corridor. Uh, this, is, um, this is the Seguin, New Braunfels area towards, uh, out towards Schertz and Guadalupe and Comal counties. Uh, Seguin is kind of on the bottom right and uh, New Braunfels is kind of in the middle. Schertz is kind of on the left 
uh, uh, side of the screen. This shows uh, kind of northern Bear County at the bottom. Uh, New Braunfels is on the right. And then uh, Bernie is actually on the left part of the screen with State Highway 46 uh, connecting uh, that particular roadway, or that, those, those cities. So for instance, uh, right in the middle, uh, it's hard to see, it might not be able to see it, but State Highway 46 is red. That would mean the existing two lanes that, that are there, just in the travel demand, population employment, by this model, it's showing that it needs an additional four lanes to move the traffic through that corridor. Clay, I know the Spurs are playing tonight, and they won't win unless I'm watching them, so I, I, I don't like asking questions. Okay. But okay, I'll move quickly. Uh, those maps that you show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> those maps that you show. Does it mean like the further blue and purple that we see a road there, that we have uh, more inadequately uh, planned for the traffic needs of those particular lanes? Because if if you look back at the Bear County picture. Um, And I'll just focus, refocused again on the south side. Um, I see a lot of purple down there, and yet I, I you know, I just, I think, I was, I'm sort of trying to reconcile that pic, this picture with this, the earlier discussion we had with Sid about, well, this is how we see growth, and if we see purple lanes, it seems to me that we're seeing that they need seven I or think six. It's, it's reflecting what Sid is showing that population growth is the Guadalupe, Comal, Kendall County area. That's where that population growth has been moving. But and if I look at the south, I see purple roads going southward. So what does that tell me? Well, it, it shows that it, much like the, the board has mentioned, that's like 181 goes to Floresville in, in uh, Wilson County, that there is a travel demand movement uh, to Wilson County. US 87 is, is well going into Wilson. Uh, county and uh, does this the, but doesn't this tell us that we have inadequate planning well I should say uh, we we're, we're those color coding is telling us that we see a need of five or six or seven lanes in those areas Means and we yet we're not it. and we're not planning for that it's we, like. we we can't ignore those externals in there and uh, that's what tech dot especially as they get outside they're working with those those communities but it is it needs to be a part of our planning as we look at it. I say we as an MPO that you don't, it doesn't drop off once it hits that MPO boundary. There are demands and needs that continue to those external areas. Okay. I just wanted to, let me quickly summarize, uh, as, as Sid talked about the, the, um, uh, the, the transportation needs and looking at uh, an unconstrained needs. We've been working with the MPO and the partners looking at uh, high capacity corridors, expressways, urban arterials, those that are dedicated corridors and we've been uh, working on a network. I'll be bringing that information actually back through the uh, planning and programming committee uh, this next month and showing some more information there on exactly how this how we're looking at this network, but basically uh, this is just looking at what the text dot is looking at in terms of managed lane system to move people through the area. Um, VIA had a 2035 plan and we're, this is the base and we're, we're looking at expanding it and how it would meet this travel demand throughout the region and uh, we'll, the, in, in providing that information to the MPO uh, and, and how the two networks uh, connect together, and they'll be modeling that to show its effectiveness, uh, and we'll be bringing that information forward to you uh, it, very soon. And then just lastly, uh, Lone Star Rail is a part of those rail high-capacity corridors that shouldn't be ignored. It's, a, it's one that's also dedicated, and uh, it's a part of that, that overall study. So with that, um, I'm going to conclude and... Uh, Unless you have any additional questions. Thank you for that presentation, Clay. Do any additional questions from any of the trustees? Uh, I think obviously what this shows is that we're going to have some challenges in the future. We need to continue to be diligent about monitoring that. And the huge challenge is going to be trying to find the resources to deal with it. Yeah, right. and, and, 
and that's something that's not just going to be our problem, an ATD problem, uh, or a VIA problem. It's going to be a regional issue that needs to be dealt with, and frankly, uh, in many ways, a statewide issue. Right. Okay. okay thank you for that presentation. Thank you very much. We don't have no action on this, right? No, sir. Okay, do we have a legal briefing on the ATD agenda? No, we don't. Uh, okay, well then, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the ATD board meeting. We have a motion, and, a, and do we have a second? Okay, so the motion is made by Mayor Marin and seconded by Mr. Miller. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. Motion carries. And now, We'll call into order the um, VIA uh, Metropolitan Transit Board of, Th of Trustees uh, meeting. Uh, we've already had our moment of reflection and our Pledge of Allegiance and announcements. We now move then to the President and CEO report. Okay, I will uh, be quick so that I'm not held responsible for keeping the Spurs from winning. Uh, <laughs> uh, when you entered the, evening, uh, entered the building this, this afternoon, uh, you saw the uh, winners of our annual youth art contest. The first place winner, or the grand prize winner, the best of show, Paula Flores, who's an eighth grader, will be here next month. I'd like to recognize her. But I just note that we ho hold a contest this year. The theme was to have uh, students from pre-K to seniors in high school. The theme was Be Smart, Don't Dart, which incorporated a, a via safety message. The winners are on the buses. The best of show is on a wrapped bus. And uh, there were over 4,500 entries, which means that the winning group out there represents less than 1% of the total entries, a pretty impressive thing. So we had an a, a excellent uh, luncheon where we recognized them. The chairman joined us, uh, Mr. Miller joined us, and we'll have the, grand, the best of show here next month. Uh, second thing I'd like to do is recognize the uh, VIA maintenance team that attended the, the rodeo earlier this month in Kansas City. Uh, we sent them off last month and we said we were hoping they would bring us back something and uh, we're happy to report that our VIA maintenance team took first place in North America. That's Carlos, Donald, and Victor. Are you here? There they are. And their coach, their coach is Phil Davis, a former first place winner. Second time in my brief tenure here that we took first place, which is quite, quite an achievement. Uh, the team practices on their own time to hone their skills, and so we thank you for the investment in that time, and, and I think Gary wants to thank you, especially because I told Gary that if he didn't come home with first, he shouldn't bother coming home at all. <laughs> so Gary, well done. Um, okay, one, okay, we had a couple of more items. Yeah, I have a couple more recognitions. I'd um, like to recognize Bonnie Prosser Elder who is a recipient of the 2014 Friends of Sam Houston Community Award. And Bonnie, come on up there. <laughs> While you have your picture taken, I will read of your glory. On Saturday, May 3rd, Bonnie received the 2014 Friends of Sam Houston Community Award. The award was presented at a community breakfast event designed to raise funds to support students at Sam Houston High School and provide co college scholarship to students seeking opportunities to advance their education. Award is presented to members of the community based upon their commitment, dedication, and service to the community. In addition to her involvement in this legal community, Bonnie is an active member of Jack and Jill's Inc. where she serves as chapter president, San Antonio chapter of Lynx Inc., Junior League of San Antonio, and Texas Women's Forum. She's been recognized by Who's Who in San Antonio and identified by the National Diversity Council as one of, quote, the most powerful and influential women of Texas. Whoa, congratulations. And you can tell she's being shy because she didn't want to be up front or anything. Just go back and hide in the corner. That's why I don't mess with Bonnie. All right. <laughs> uh, my, last, my last recognition is to our team here that runs VIA's Thrive Wellness Program, the San Antonio Business Group on Health, in collaboration with the Mayor's Fitness Council, has awarded VIA Metropolitan Transit the Silver Level Recognition and Healthy Workplace Recognition Award Program. Uh, the program recognizes wellness efforts in six areas, culture, health promotion and education, physical activity, nutrition, smoking and tobacco use, or should be non-use, I think, health benefits and value-based 
and value-based benefits. Uh, VIA's Thrive Wellness Program serves to improve the quality of life for VIA employees through education activity, emp empowerment, and support. It goes beyond exercise and nutrition to address a range of health-related issues, and some of the services include personalized exercise plan, customized meal plan, nutritional education, on-site fitness classes, health fairs and screenings, health seminars, and weight loss challenges. VIA is only, is only one of 31 large work employers of 200 more employers, employees, I'm sorry, in San Antonio who received this award. And receiving it, uh, Justin Kruger, here's our wellness coordinator, Orlando Gallego, his manager, and Marcus Peoples, the VP of HR. As you can see as they come forward, they're each the epitome of wellness. Congratulations, guys. That is my report. That's Jeff's report, and with one item, there's a chairman's report, and I'm doing this because Jeff was too shy to include it himself. Um, I was fortunate on May 1st to be able to attend a special ceremony for the Texas Diversity Council, and they recognize CEOs as champions of diversity, and they recognize a number of CEOs, including folks like uh, Joe Robles from USAA, uh, Gary Kelly, the CEO of Southwest Airlines, and our Doyle, Doyle Benneby, CEO of CPS, and our own Jeff Arndt, the CEO of uh, VIA. And so, <laughs> recognized as one of six recipients. It was a, an unbelievable uh, ceremony. Colin Powell was the keynote speaker, and he did a tremendous job uh, in terms of making that presentation. Uh, something we should be very proud of. And I guess the best way to, to describe uh, Jeff's attitude about diversity is in his own words that he used when he was uniquely qualified for that uh, Champion Diversity Award. And in that, he talked about, I have particularly enjoyed my career in public transportation, knowing that our services help provide access to jobs, education, health services, and other important purposes to the entire community. Simply put, transit provides inclusive opportunity. And VIA walks the diversity talk. I have senior and executive management teams that reflect the diversity of our community. Our business supplier diversity program ensures that public dollars are spent to support the variety of business ownership scenarios and business sizes within our region, giving us the best value for our dollars invested. Diversity is a strong thread in the fabric of everything VIA undertakes in our services, with our staffing, and our business practices. And with that, I think that very well summarizes Jeff's attitude. We're very proud of his accomplishment. We want to thank him and congratulate him for that. Jeff was being shy about that. He didn't have it on the draft agenda. At the executive committee, we had to add it uh, to the agenda uh, despite his protestations. I think it's important to recognize that. Okay, that completes our uh, introductory items. Uh, we now want to move to our citizens to be heard session. And uh, do we, we can start now with the first speaker. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have five citizens to be heard tonight. As your name is called, you're welcome to come to the front to make your comments. If you'd like to make the comments from where you sit, please raise your hand. The microphone will be brought to you. Damon Mason. Uh, 
citations via trustees. It is via citations. It is I, Daniel Mason. Via, I would like to explain to me about the length of turnaround time of, of the si system that you heard re response letter from, from, the, from the April 2014 meeting to arrive. In this case, it it, on, on the 21st of May 2014. Further explaining matters, why is the response letter itself so short? Why are you behaving toward your customers as if they are morons? I'm glad that you're acknowledging my concern about the future of the, U of the U.S. dollar. However, if you're truly concerned, you would not be spending these monster sums of cash. Via, slam the brakes in these centuries of yours. There is no reason for your centuries to be interested in what I have on my cell phone or what I have in this mic. I, I have told you, I have told your centuries, I have ice water in here. Once I do that, it should be end of discussion. Willie May Clay. It is now 6.41. And you know it's unusual that Citizens to be Heard is delayed this long. It says a lot about your attitude toward the citizens. In the past, we've had citizens presented very somewhat near the, the uh, early part of the presentation. It used to be maybe 6.15 or so, but that changed. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to consider the citizens a little more. My concern today has to do with time. Time is very important, not only to individuals, but to the uh, and I want you to take it seriously. Chairman Brazilio, you weren't on the board last year, but last summer, the board um, uh, okayed, approved a 30-minute window that was brought to them by staff. And your predecessor asked a very important question when it was presented, because I had preceded, my comments had preceded the board. And it was asked of the board, with this 30-minute window, what effect will it have on the ridership, on the riders? And the staff responded, it'll make our system more efficient. Well, sir, let me tell you, I'm all for efficiency. But that 30-minute window, it took 27 minutes of my time today just waiting and watching for that van. So three more minutes shy of the 30 minute window, the system would not consider that van to have been late. But as far as I'm concerned, my time was wasted. And so let me tell you, the comment was made, you ought to be, you know, it's important that you be transported. Yeah, transportation is important, but time is also important. And I'm asking you again, consider the, the effectiveness of this 30-minute window. You have some leeway. You're not locked in to the 30-minute window support per se. You've used the maximum amount of time. You could always make changes. So I'm saying look at what you're dealing with. Also look at the effects it's having on on the riders. I'll Shelley I'm McMullen. just asking that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the feedback. Ferris Hodge. Okay, y'all loosen up a little bit. We're already late and we're going to get wet, so so much for that. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. I want to read this. We are always trying to sue somebody. And this is dealing with... Uh, Streetcar, NRE dot uh, dot dot via Metro Parliament Administration Transit District ETAL dot 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 calls number D dash one dash GN dash thirteen dash zero zero four two three zero in the District Court of Travis 
Texas, 126 jurisdiction. Uh, Judge Wolf said that he can't stop Via for doing what he, what y'all gonna do. Judge Wolf appointed four people to be on the Via board. He had his meetings real early in the morning. And I told y'all the last time that I was here, we're gonna fight y'all tooth and nail. The Attorney General is now getting involved in the way y'all spend money. Y'all don't have enough money for 281. Y'all need to postpone 281 for the next four years. Y'all want to build a tall, a rising building, 500 parking spaces. You don't need to build nothing like that. The main thing I want to talk about before I run out, Randolph Park and Ride, District 2. That place is too small. The seating part is too small. The restroom, you need four restrooms for the regular people. You need three restrooms for the disabled. The place smell bad, look bad. The parking ride is too small. Uh, Crossroads parking ride is too small. The men's restroom smell bad. The, the urinal is up too high. All the urine is on the floor. And people walk in the rest of the building and it smells like a sewer. Y'all need to strip those floors. Y'all need to uh, wax those floors about once a month. And then y'all need to get with uh, Crossroads Park and Ride, see can they uh, go 10 acres to build another park and ride twice the size that they already have. That West Side module ought to be just called West Side uh, Via Bus Transit System. No nickname, no Indians, and all this other stuff y'all been talking about the last couple of uh, 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 years. And all, and all y'all's old parking rides need to be redid first not none of these new parking rides. 281 can wait another four years. And the, 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 uh, the figures that y'all was using, I think they was way off myself. I'm not no mathematician, but I know how to count. And y'all just throwing figures in there. And the last thing, Bill, you need to give y'all some employees, um, Mr. Pazinho, a 15% pay raise. You got about 250 employees who will not retire. You need to uh, give them uh, early retirement and, uh, and keep the insurance. You got employees that are part-time, have not had a pay raise in three years because they have been working 17, 20, and 25 years. Y'all are discriminating against y'all's employees. Y'all ought to be ashamed of yourself. Shame, shame, shame. Have a beautiful day. Now I'm gonna get home. Lori Zertucci. I gotta get out of this bed. Well, Good evening, okay? uh, yes, uh, my name is Laurie Zertucci. I just have a concern that I want to bring. Uh, when I got off the van, Ruben told me that um, we were under some kind of severe weather threat, tornado warning, until midnight. And uh, I was like, why can't um, VIA, if they have people traveling on VIA trans going to the meetings, um, why can't they? Uh, alert the drivers to this and give the person the option of going home or going to the meeting and so the person could feel safe because um, once they're here at the meeting this could be the safest building but if the vans are delayed about an hour and a half to two hours or three the person is stuck and if they had take medication or whatever you know, there should be some kind of a warning to the drivers that they know they, they have people that are coming to this meeting and they should be given the option, do you want to continue to come or you want to go home? And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, there are no more citizens to be heard. Thank you. Um, I believe we have uh, some folks that are uh, going to be having to leave and we have an important uh, executive session to consider uh, and so we're going to step into executive session right now and we have two uh, uh, areas of executive session uh, and I'll read the first one. The time is now 6.50 o'clock p.m. and the VA Metropolitan Transit Board of Trustees will officially go into a closed executive session. The items we will discuss during this executive session are as follows. Item 14, entitled Real Estate, 
14A1 bus yard expansion, 601 West Cypress, West Cypress, 14A2 bus yard expansion, 209 Firstburg Road, and 14B discussion and possible action on status and acquisition of the following 0.324 acre tract of land situated in the city of San Antonio, Bear County, Texas, located at the intersection of Firstburg Road, West Laurel, and La Harp Street, and commonly referred to as Five Points or 819 West Laurel which are executive session items pursuant to the Texas Government Code, Section 551.071, entitled Consultation with Attorney, and Section 551.072, entitled Real Property. And Item 15, entitled Legal Briefing, Discussion and Possible Action on the Status of the Following Litigation via Metropolitan Advanced Transportation District et al., Clause Number D-1-GN-13-004230 in the District Court of Travis County, Texas, 126th Judicial District and related matters before the 3rd District Court of Appeals. 15B, via City of San Antonio Agreement regarding streetcar portion of via Smart Move Program. And 15C, via ATD Authority, develop, operate, and maintain the Transit Authority System, Chapter 451 of the Texas Transportation Code, which are executive sessionized person to the Texas Government Code, Section 551.071, entitled Consultation with Attorney. All persons who are authorized to attend the session, please proceed to the small conference room. And for the record, I am recused from discussing item number 14, so I will not proceed for that item. We're reconvening uh, our open session. We are returning now. It is now 8, 18 o'clock p.m. and we are officially coming out of closed executive session regarding agenda items 14A1. A2, 14B, 15A, B, and C. No deliberations of public policy or vote taking occurred during the executive session. I believe now we're on uh, item six consent agenda. Is that correct? No one's going to disagree with me, so I think I'm right. I'd ask for a yeah, motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. That takes us to item seven, modern uh, streetcar update. Good evening, members of the board. I'm gonna ask Jason and Brent to come up and give you a brief update on the streetcar project. Um, due to the time late evening hours, I'm gonna ask um, staff just to move to the discussion on the North Alamo option, if that is okay with the board, and uh, we'll be sure to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. And to explain the uh, the uh, planning public, the planning and project development committee has also endorsed staff recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Gambetta. <coughs> okay. Good evening, members of the board. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go through these slides, and if there's any questions we have, if I went through something too quickly, I'd be happy to answer it then. Uh, we just want to start today with uh, what the board action is that we're asking for, which is. Uh, we did bring last month a couple of uh, one of the design options to have that taken from uh, the locally preferred alternative and similarly this is the second of those two design options we're uh, proposing to move forward from that as well so our recommendation is that we do have a two-way operation on Broadway uh, as opposed to one direction on, on North Alamo Street and one direction on Broadway um, this is due to several factors uh, we believe it's a uh, user-friendly operation. Uh, we did get feedback from the city. It is uh, in accordance with uh, adopted plans for the area. Um, we also believe that there is a lower environmental risk and uh, greater potential for transformative development uh, in that particular corridor. So I'll, I'll just go quickly through these. We did look at several different criteria, very similar to what we did with the alternative analysis in general. Um, we did add construction impacts, fiesta impacts, looked a little more closely at adopted plans, and then got uh, feedback from the city. So I have a few slides that concentrate primarily on economic development, construction impacts, and adopted plans. The construction impacts, basically what we saw there was that um, Broadway would limit construction to one street instead of two. Um, this is relevant because uh, just because we have, we would have one a lane in one direction for streetcar doesn't mean that we would restrain construction to just one lane. It would could be across the street depending on the sec segment. And then 
Another was a, a SAWS project uh, as we've been doing our, um, our regular utility coordination at this point. We did find that there was re a recent rehab on uh, one particular pipe and there's going to be another major capital investment being made on a uh, sewer main uh, that would be in uh, at about the same time or a little bit before even we would be ready to begin construction. So this is something that SAWS is uh, required to do uh, with EPA and they do need to have that completed by a certain date. Then moving on to economic development, essentially just to point out uh, North Alamo Street and Broadway are about 300 to 350 feet apart depending on where, where you're at. Uh, benefits of streetcar do extend uh, about a quarter mile from each stop and um, east of Alamo on some parts as, as you get north actually of the interchange this is not the case but uh, below that certainly there there is a barrier with the freeway uh, we think that obviously we'd be able to offer the best service with the two-way operation and then um, that last point does kind of carry over into the adoptive plans here um, basically what the adoptive plans suggested this is the River North master plan and the Midtown Brackenridge uh, TERS plan. These two um, adopted plans basically show Broadway as the central spine uh, through those areas. Uh, it does, it's seen as a way to connect people from the development that would occur along the corridor to the various neighborhoods and uh, other neighborhood commercial uses and cultural um, uses further up Broadway as we expand in the future. Um, and the existing land use condition, and I'll talk about this in just a second, um, is basically, it basically leads to a different type of development on one street or another. And so just to give an example of that point, this is an excerpt from the River North Master Plan. And so you see Broadway there in blue, North Alamo in green. And because there are larger lots and much larger buildings that are industrial in nature, not necessarily historic on Broadway, we think that there is a, and, and actually not just that we think, the River North Master Plan suggests that there would be um, better potential to assemble property and create larger scale development. That doesn't necessarily mean more development or better quality, that's just a different type. And then on Broadway there's a lot more smaller historic structures and in this particular plan the idea is that that becomes more of a neighborhood. Um, eclectic new and historic uh, architecture uh, along that particular route so and you see they're even zoned differently so um, along Broadway you have what's called a River North corridor which is a transect of that particular zoning neighborhood stabilization is mostly on North Alamo and so that actually dictates a different type of intensity although you'll see the red outlines around the blocks this is something that says that basically we want retail frontage on these particular areas. So this is an important point and what we want to do is make sure that when we actually see development on North Alamo that we're actually able, able to carry that around as the plan suggests. And the same thing, very similar for the Midtown uh, Brackenridge uh, TERS plan. You see a lot of uh, emphasis on Broadway, although up once we get just north of Josephine Street uh, on the east side of North Alamo you also see uh, some of that higher intensity development, what they've called urban core uh, in that particular area. So uh, just as, as we've sort of seen the different ways that development could occur, we've looked at these uh, adopted plans and uh, received feedback from city staff and so forth. Um, our recommendation again is that we keep the two-way uh, operation on Broadway and, and go ahead and uh, move on from the North Alamo piece. Be happy to take any questions if there are any. Are you looking for action this evening? Yes, we are. Okay. And that's to, uh, your recommendation is to uh, not pursue the Al North Alamo option, but instead to have the uh, up, in, up north and down south uh, route only on Broadway. Yes, sir. Any questions from the, from the board? If not, can I have a motion to approve the recommendation? And second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item, thank you, gentlemen. Item 8, Fort Sam Houston update.
Good evening. Good evening. I'm uh, Tracy Manning, the manager of service planning and scheduling here. And I'll try and be brief with this. This is just an update on uh, the activities at Fort Sam Houston, our planning efforts. Uh, we're trying to determine the feasibility of uh, New Braunfels Avenue reopening through Fort Sam and the service options. Establish uh, new east side route or extension of a route that operates north-south on Walters uh, to Fort Sam Houston, something that we should be bringing uh, next month with our service changes. And then coordination efforts with uh, the Joint Base San Antonio Partnership Initiative. And so this is uh, just a map of our old service area that used to operate in Fort Sam. And as you can see, uh, the 11 and the 512 used to operate on New Braunfels Avenue. And so this is uh, going into some of the impacts that did, there was some lost connectivity with fire police, transit, and alternate transportation for bikes and pedestrians with the closure of New Braunfels. Uh, the BRAC 2005 growth management plan also identified the closure of the roadway to through traffic Fort Sam Houston resulted in demise of retail businesses south of Fort Sam. Uh, the loss of traffic has see uh, some of the traffic counts before with 15, 17,000 range uh, on New Braunfels and now of course it's just uh, the neighborhood trips. And so if we were to add service, the red line in this map is actually the old Route 11 that operated through there. And so our plan would be to operate this green line, that would be our Route 10, which is currently this blue line out here. But there's already service with routes 9, 14, and of course the lower level with the streetcar that Jason was just going over. And then in addition to that, we've looked at uh, the 515, as I said, operating on Walters, and we'll probably be coming back to you next month uh, with that for our fall changes. And what this does, it connects some, you know, besides the, the Walter Street gate, it provides service to Wheatley Court, Sutton Oaks, uh, St. Phillips, uh, McCreelis. Also supports the Eastside Promise and Choice initiatives, extends into Fort Sam. And this is a map, I think you may have seen this before. There's all these crossings, so it actually provides a lot of uh, one transfer trips uh, for the, uh, the the various east side radials that are crossing through there. And then we've been uh, working with the Joint Base San Antonio, the partnership initiative. One of the things we've looked at is uh, our 16 and 65 express routes to the USO have been doing very well on Saturdays. And so we're looking at maybe adding some Sunday service to that uh, in the future. And that may be on the, those that come next month. And of course, these are the two routes. Uh, this is the detour currently because of the Market Street closure in downtown, but of course, Port Sam and Lackland. And then our next steps, uh, we're scheduling a meeting with uh, the Port Sam Houston uh, commander uh, to go over what, what maybe uh, we can do with the New Braunfels Avenue connection. And then we're looking at uh, closing some gaps, like I said, with the other service that we're providing out there, the 515, maybe 1665. And uh, we'll continue to work with Joint Base Partnership. We have a meeting uh, next week again with them. Uh, we had some other meetings, and I think uh, Board Member uh, Miller would like to show, he wanted to show this flyover of, this is New Braunfels Avenue at Wilson if we're able to uh, get access or provide a, you know, pedestrian passage through here. This is going over Fort Sam. And so, I uh, guess, basically, New Braunfels Avenue going down uh, below Wilson, but maintaining, a, I guess, a secure area so automobile traffic and pedestrian traffic can still go along the route. And this was some estimated uh, costs. So, if there's any questions, this is just an information only item. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Are there any questions? Do you have any questions?
you know, uh, just I comment. can tell you we're going to continue to meet on. Yes, Mayor. No, I, I was just on Fort Sam Houston, and it pained me to watch um, privates get into a yellow cab. And my, my grandfather was a cab driver in New York, so I'm not anti-cab, but having been, uh, you know, an E1 in the military many years ago, uh, they don't uh, pay cab prices, but they for sure would be, you know, great customers of VIA, and we would provide a, a, a needed service if we could get back on to Fort Sam, yes. get downtown, and we cut down in, you know, driving incidents. Uh, well, there's no doubt that it's been part of the community for years, century, almost a century. So um, it is an important part of that. Any other questions on, and this is on the Fort Sam Houston update, right? Correct. Okay. Hearing none, then we'll go to the next item, and that's the expansion of uh, VIA Trans Tax Cap Subsidy and will call program. Did we get started for that? Does anybody know what the score is? 26-20. Who's winning? Thunder. Oh, I'm not watching them. What's the score? 26-20. 26-20, favor of the Thunder. Not complaining because I'm not watching them. Okay. We got important things to consider here. Yeah, like, you, like you, I'm very sorry to hear that, so I'll get through this as quickly as I can. Go right ahead. Okay, this has to do with uh, the Via Trans Taxi Service Initiative, which began about uh, a year ago, and under which Via has contracted with Yellow Cab of San Antonio to provide supplemental taxi service in support of some via trans functions. Particularly, uh, the will call service and what we call taxi subsidy service. Uh, under will call, uh, some of our customers are transported by taxis at VIA's direction. Under the subsidy part of the service, customers deal directly with yellow cab uh, <coughs> to obtain short-term trips that are to some extent and in some cases completely subsidized by VIA. Uh, the goal of this program, again, was to reduce the customer wait time for will call trips, which in some cases can be substantial, and also to provide customers the benefit of same-day reservations, which they get with the subsidy service and do not get under the ADA-directed Viatran service. This benefits the customers, and it also improves the cost-effectiveness of the Viatran system, thus benefiting Via as well. So this has been as about as close as it comes around here to a win-win situation. It began about a year ago, as I said, and although it's been well received by our customers, the patronage has been a little less than we had initially planned for. We had budgeted for up to 200 subsidy trips per day and 50 uh, will call trips per day. That's running about 60 to 75 percent of, of, uh, of actual these days. Mm -hmm. And so we have the opportunity to consider an adjustment to the program. Um, in discussing this amongst staff and with the customers, which has happened several times in the recent Viatrans uh, workshops, it has come down to really two options. One would be to maintain the current uh, weekday program with no change but to add weekend service. Another would be to keep the current weekday program, which is only Monday through Friday, but to increase the subsidy rate. And again, after discussions at the staff level, discussions with our customers, there is a clear preference to keep the current subsidy rate, which is $9 per trip, but expand the program to cover Saturdays and Sundays as well. If we did this, this would start in June. There is sufficient uh, <coughs> uh, uh, money within the current year's budget to do this, and we believe to continue it into next year as well. And so the resolution that, accompli that accompanies the memo on this particular item asks for board authorization to modify and expand the VIA Trans Taxity Subsidy Service to include weekend service. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. As chairman of Thank the you for that presentation. Yes, go ahead. As Joe. chairman of the Accessible Trans, uh, uh, Transportation Committee, I want to commend staff uh, for finding a way to continue to reach out to our disabled community. And uh, when we found out that we weren't getting as many riders as possible, 
the idea of ex expanding the days without um, without uh, any um, impact to the budget. So I want to commend you. Thank you, sir. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to approve by Mr. Lee and a second by uh, Rebecca Cedillo and Lou Miller, second and third. <laughs> Are there any additional questions? Hearing none, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the next item, which is the um, Intergovernmental Relations and Public Affairs Committee Community Representatives. And I believe uh, Dr. Mendoza is going to make making that presentation. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, I'm here this evening. I'll be very brief on um, item number 10. Uh, the purpose is to uh, bring forward for your approval the five community liaison representatives. These are advisory appointments to the IGR, uh, Public Affairs Committee. And uh, the five listed in your board packet are Mr. Leo Gomez, Mayor Chris Riley, Mr. Dwayne Robinson, Ms. Linda Chavez Thompson, and Mr. Dwayne Wilson. And I'm here for action. Uh, this did go before the IGR PA committee and also before executive board to move forward for full approval by the board. I, I question. A, oh, this is something I think we've discussed. Uh, well, I had a question. I'm because sorry. I think you just said it well, came before you do your question, you could I have a motion? Do we have a motion to approve? Motion. Second. I have a motion by David Warren, second by second. Gerald Lee. I'll say, go ahead then. Yes, Mr. It, Miller. It hadn't gone before IGR yet, has it? The names? Yes, sir. I believe they went at, came before, I, I, you're correct, sir. Okay. It went before the executive committee for oh, board approval. Correct. You're Thank correct. You. Thank you. I stand corrected. Mr. Chair, I, I just have a question regarding, I think it's great to have inclusion and to have different people from different parts of our community involved in helping us think through problems and all of that. And I think it's also important for us to remember our role as, as the appointed board members who are ultimately going to have to make decisions. And I just want to make sure that whenever we're bringing folks to help us, that they ultimately understand and that we're transparent with them about ultimately we're the ultimate decision makers. And I say that not because I don't want their input. I want it and we need it. Um, but it's sometimes folks in any situation under miscommunication, whatever, may have the impression that ultimately input is to be direction or something. And I don't know that any of these people would specifically feel that way. But I think it's important for us to communicate that it's a, a helpful role that they'll be playing and that ultimately we have to make the decision in whatever we do. And I know we're going to have a similar group or a different group for streetcar as well. And again, I just want to reiterate that, not, not as a pushback, but just sort of as transparency. So apart from that, I think it's a great idea to have these folks. Thank you, Board I think and it's important to note that they're non-voting uh, advisory members. Yes, Steve, you had a question. I, I'd hope that, uh, as chairman of IGR, I'd hope that we would have had this on a committee ad agenda, but it uh, unfortunately fell off. But since that committee is a committee of the whole, and we're here as a committee of the whole, uh, <laughs> this would be the opportunity to, to vet, because that's what I was hoping we could accomplish, is to vet these names or any other names. So you know, this is that opportunity one. Uh, and then I think it is important to go forward, because we have our next committee meeting next week. Right. Uh, and it'd be important to have these these people involved. And then my second question: Have these people been contacted? All five of them? We have most of them. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez has spoken to to um, most of the people on this list, as have I. So I believe the one person we haven't spoken directly to has been Dwayne Robinson. All right. I have a call in to him, but I've not. Spoken and they'll all be invited to the committee meeting next That's week. That's correct, sir. Thank you. So they volunteered. Is 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 when you say you've spoken to them. You spoke to them to tell them that they are under consideration. They're under consideration. They're being nominated. Yeah. They've been nominated. Well, if this is the place to vet, I can cannot speak more highly of Mayor Riley. So that's the one on the list I know, and I would support her nomination for any position. The rest of them are up to you. <laughs> any additional questions? Okay. Uh, in the, just to speak more clearly to the issue that I raised earlier, what are they being told? Is there going to be a mission statement or something that kind of lays out more clearly their roles? Because I think it's obviously they deserve to know what they're being asked to do and what their role should be as well. 
It is. And you had asked me to start working on a mission yeah. and vision for these two committees. I've begun to do that, and that would be included okay. for them as we speak to them. And I'm also conveying written materials to them based on the board action. Can, can we, since it's for the IGR committee, can we have the chair it'll maybe vet what we're going to give them? Absolutely. So that if you don't and mind, I did, Steve. I had made that commitment to, okay. to the chair that I would be sure that before anything went out, he would see that. Thank and you. I, and I might point out, this is not a new concept. Uh, there were always community advisors on the IGR committee in the past. And in fact, two of these folks were community advisors uh, in the past. And, and so there'll be a cont continuity of two of them and then broadening it a little bit more, just like we brought in the IGR committee to become the committee that deals with public affairs and ultimately the committee to hold because every board member wanted to be on it. <laughs> okay, any additional questions? Hearing none, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? One abstention. One abstention. Motion carries with Mr. Miller abstaining. Okay, that then brings us to uh, our last item, uh, and that's on the Modern Streetcar Advisory Committee, and um, some minor changes on that, and Diana, you're gonna make that presentation as well. This is really to uh, request uh, possible board action regarding an amendment to the membership of the Streetcar Advisory Committee. Uh, when we were reviewing that again, uh, we noted that we had left some critical representation off, yep. in particular from labor, and then we had from the dais a recommendation that the environmental community also be included. So we have added two additional organizations. That would be uh -huh. the FL CIO and also the Alamo Sierra Club. So those would, those would be the two organizations bringing the total membership to 23. And I would ask for formal action by the board uh, for approval to amend the original Streetcar Advisory Committee representation from 21 to 23, uh, including the representation from Labor AFL-CIO and uh, the environmental community, the Alamo Sierra Club. So moved. Second. We have a motion. Made a motion. Okay. Second. Uh, Mr. Leo made a motion. Harrison. And what, what, one question again, just that we again do the same thing with transparency and the mission statement and stuff. And, uh, who maybe should see that so that we don't bog down this process, but you chair perhaps on the streetcar com uh, committee to see what their mission is so that there's no misunderstanding? We can, and uh, we can have re re brought back to the IGR <coughs> Okay. Okay. Just again so that everyone understands. I've drafted um, a draft of that for his review. Thank you. And in a particular case, the committee is not there to work on whether or not we should have streetcar. It's how we're going to do it. Right. Okay. They are an advisory resource. <laughs> Make sure that's in the mission statement. Absolutely. <laughs> it's written in there in the draft. Well, because these are all uh, uh, stakeholders. That's correct. And I right. want them to be part of that process. All right. The implementation process. Well, we've had that discussion already as a community. We're not at that stage anymore. It's now, you know, these other issues. So, anyway. Okay, we have a motion to second any additional questions. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Motion carries. It's my understanding that uh, there is a follow up action yes, sir. on item 14, on and I have recused myself from that, so I will step out of the room. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We do have an action on item 14, and Mr. Miller, will you please read the motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, the subject is strategic planning and project development two properties for bus yard expansion. Whereas Via Metropolitan Transit has a need to expand its bus yard to accommodate new rolling stock being acquired. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the president, CEO, or his designee is hereby authorized to negotiate and execute a sales agreement with the owners to purchase fee simple title to the following described real property. Under terms and conditions, the president slash CEO deems acceptable including any necessary rezoning and satisfactory environmental testing results. One, Lot G, Block 44, New City, Block 350 in the City of San Antonio, Bear County, Texas, according to plat thereof, recorded in Volume 368, Page 361, Deed and Plat Records of Bear County, Texas, and being that same property conveyed by deed recorded in Volume 7229, Page 102, of the official public records of real property of Bear County, Texas, being further known as 601, West Cypress. Number two, being 0 .056 acres out of lot Southwest Tri 26.98 FT of two, block 50, New City Block 349 and Northwest IRR 
67.86 feet of 17, New City Block 680, San Antonio, Bear County, Texas, and being that same property identified as parcel 1 conveyed by deed recorded in volume 15703, page 808 of the official public records of real property of Bear County, Texas, being further known as 209 Fredericksburg Road. We make a motion to... Can you read those legal descriptions one more time? Certainly. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Make a motion. <laughs> Do we have a motion in a second? Probably motion. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, oh, any questions, sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, board. Uh, that is the last item that we have on the agenda. We have uh, postponed items 12 and 13. And so, without any one, other. One quick update. Uh, oh. The, uh, Mr. Arndt had asked me to give a quick update. In addition to the, um, the route change for Fort Sam or the proposed route change that we're pursuing, there was a presentation made to St. Phillips College. Uh, it was attended by Tracy Manning, uh, Mr. Keith Hahn, and Priscilla Engel. We met with uh, Dr. Lawson and her leadership team at a staff meeting on a Tuesday morning, and we were able to generate an awful lot of support for the proposed change. What we're proposing is a route that is directly down Walter Street which in the past, all the routes have gone from east to west. There was no north-south, which meant that if a person was traveling about three miles down the street from, say, 35 down to St. Phillips College, it would take them about 45 minutes. We've changed that into about a 15-minute ride. So that, in addition to the Ford Sam Houston um, route changes, will, should be beneficial, extremely beneficial to the east side of San Antonio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that completes our agenda. Yes, it does. And so uh, the chair will entertain a motion to so adjourn. move. Second. A motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. See you next week, probably. <laughs> <laughs> see you tomorrow. We're adjourned. I'll see you tomorrow.